having this this consistency of meetings on a daily basis because we're getting to see faces and names and familiarity you know um remind me guna where you're based united emirates uh yeah okay okay so you know to, you know, recognizing Olive in Cameroon, Guna in the United Emirates, obviously with Jan in, in Belgium, a handful of us from the US, Alf in, in Sweden. I mean, there's just, we have this, uh, you know, it's the, the requisite a journey, requisite agility journey of, of camaraderie, which is kind of fun as we're about to get started here. Um, I would invite you to throw a, a hello in, in the chat and, and just again, remind everyone where you're from and okay. anticipate we'll have a few more people joining as we get started here. But uh, I'm watching my clock and it's 10.59. So Lindsay, I think we're, we're just about ready. Sure, do you wanna wait for a couple of minutes just for people to join or? Uh... We can, yeah, we can do that I mean, because I'm anticipating that we'll have probably a couple more sessions typically have started to fill up right at the hour or so forth. I'm interested, Lindsay, in uh, your experience of preparing for this particular event. I know that, that it's different from any event that I've ever had to prepare for. What have you noticed about it? Well, I'm, I mean, on one hand, it's a much bigger event because there are so many <laughs> sessions and um, I am. Tr I have been making a point of trying to tune into because I haven't been able to attend every session. I'm just frantically running my own business. I've been trying to make a point of tuning into, you know, the zone of the event as well as the reactions to the event. Uh, so it was really handy to talk to Sabina about what she was saying yesterday. Um, and I'm I'm kind of going on the fly a little bit because the conversation's unfolding as far as I can gather. And I have a particular angle to come in from. So, you know, I'm just I'm just evolving what happened from the video that I put out there in my previous session into um, where I think this best fits in the next session. Um, and I did a, some pre-work over the last few days on it. So I want to turn it more into a panel event, actually, with everybody here being the panel, um, because after all, this is being recorded and we are going to be going into our next stage to sort of accumulate everything that's been discussed and I think everybody here should be part of the panel so I'm I'm going to throw some stimulus into the room and I'm going to hope that people are interested in um, giving their thoughts because the topic of alignment that I'm discussing is a bit of a meta topic right so that sounds great well it's uh, 11 o'clock well after 11 let's go ahead and get started and, and Pierre if you want to just make sure that we're recording So it's nice to see some familiar faces. Hi, Jan. Hello, Lucy. Hey, and um, Pierre as well. And um, yeah, it's nice to be part of this process. I'm interested in next week's panels, but uh, for the moment, um, anyway, just to introduce myself. Um, my name is Lindsay Ashton Bogart, as you can see. I'm sitting in the Netherlands. I've been based here for about 15 years. I'm originally from the UK. And I, last time put a video out there about my what I'm taking about how alignment relates to practice in business and I'd like to expand on that today so I'm going to share my my screen and um, put a few slides out there so you're able to see this right yep. yes yeah. okay so Last time I spoke about alignment, it's still about alignment, but I'm conscious that what, you know, some people out there, it's all about preferences in it, isn't it? We've all got different personalities and I'm very much a hands-on, let's get stuff done person. So I'm approaching things from a very practical point of view. And I'm always aware of the risk of a lot of good intent and a lot of good um, conversation and a lot of good collaboration in terms of, um, ideas and thoughts going forward, but I'm really hell bent on making sure that we can put some of this into actual action and that that's based on alignment because we all see things differently and we all look at the world in a different way 
And unless we can share an understanding and share some mental models about what's going on and how we're going to collaborate to deliver, it's still just intent. So the kind of um, work that I do, just so that you know, is I actually run a process um, uh, which starts with a tool that identifies and measures alignment gaps between people and teams. And it does that by comparing the way that people see their whole system at work. And that's from a cognitive perspective and a behavioral perspective so that you can see the gaps because most of the alignment gaps between people are not visible. And then there is a process that supports people in dealing with those gaps. So that's my kind of area of expertise. And the journey that I'd like to kind of look at today is, is coming up with this challenge of alignment and the challenge, the broader challenge that we're looking at today, then to look at the role of alignment, then to look at three different levels of alignment that, that you know, when you start to unpack it, let's learn a bit more about this. And then there are some problems with that. Um, the world has been more complex, been getting more and more complex. And the more complex it is, the more alignment there is to, there are more that things there are to align on. So let's just look at that now. I'm going to come back to a slide that I put into the video um, in my last session. And that slide is a fundamental challenge and it's just put so simply. It talks about the fact that effective collaboration, so putting things out into action, moving intent to implementation, is not just a case of putting the right people with the relevant knowledge together and expecting them to go on with it, even if they wanted to. Because they face the challenge of integrating their perspectives. How do they see things? What is going on? What are our objectives? What are we trying to achieve? What's the vision? Um, they, that's the challenge of integration. But the other challenge is actually collaborating, which is more behavioral. It's about how do people actually interact both on a practical level of, um, you know, for example, what platform are we using? What documents are we using? What language terms are we using? But it's also about how people are interdependent, how they are managing tasks, how they, how cohesive they are as a team, their levels of commitment, um, how psychologically safe their environment is in order for them um, to be able to open up and share mental models in order to deliver together. So this is a challenge that I think is commonplace to a whole load of stuff. It's a very meta level view of an alignment challenge. And let's just come back to where we are in the subject today, because um, I wrote a blog before requisite agility, or at least to kick off my part of requisite agility that says, you know, we're expecting people keep talking about the new normal. There's never been a normal, in my view. Um, we're always in a unique situation. Things are changing all the time, every day. And we need to move through our challenges by making the best choices and aligning to implement those together. OK. And I'm also posturing that challenges that we're dealing to with today, they're not new. They're just intense and they're happening simultaneously. So even if there's a vaccine, even if the, the levels come down, even if we manage to get those waves of infection down to wave two and three and reduce them gradually, we're still going to have challenges. They just not, might not happen in the same order. Um, those challenges are overall uncertainty, change, complexity, diversity, but they're also very specific. Health and safety, employee retention and attrition, supply and demand, remote interaction, anxiety, investor confidence, all of those challenges, we've seen them before. They're just all happening at the same time. But that's why it makes the need for alignment so much more. So we do need to move through these challenges and it's about making the best choices and it's about then aligning so that we can deliver together, whatever that is. Now we knew, normally do this through organizations, of course, organizing ourselves in either formal organizations, informal organizations, they can be private sector, voluntary, but every way that we organize ourselves is conditional. That's obviously the meaning of the word requisite. The approach depends on the situation. So how do we do this is the topic that we're going to get into. 
Now I happened to stumble across something fascinating. Um, and um, it's about alignment and the, the deeper level of it. So I'll get onto that. But we are looking at this piece now. We're looking at aligning for effective delivery because the top part there about intent is about leadership. It's the role of the leader to be making choices. Now, when I say leader, that's just anybody who's making choices within their sphere of influence. And obviously the, we're all leaders. So us in this room now, people who are looking at this, anybody who's dealing with their own life is leading their choices by making decisions. So I'm not saying that we're divorced from the top bit, but I'm just going to look at the second bit. So here's the question, what kind of alignment? Now there's a whole, that goes into a whole area here, but I'd like to show you um, this piece that I stumbled across. Um, first, it's alignment of the enterprise. And this is by a professor, assistant professor at Said Business School, Jonathan Trevor and, and his colleague, Barry Barco. And they wrote um, a book called Align, which was actually Financial Times Book of the Month recently. And the alignment of the enterprise is interesting because it's not about people necessarily, although people do it, but the alignment of the enterprise is making sure that the purpose and the strategy and the capability and the management systems and the architecture, those five pieces across the, the chart there, it's making sure that they are aligned. Now, believe it or not, that is relatively new because the whole idea that we needed to be aligned across an enterprise in this way as part of the intent piece, I would say, um, is, is becoming more established now, but certainly wasn't there um, decades ago. So this is, this is sort of starting to gain some real traction now. And the question here is, what approach do they take is based on the situation? So it's conditional, it's requisite. And the approaches that um, Jonathan Trevor sets out take a form like this. So these, what's on these different axes is interesting because on the bottom we've got autonomy and at the top we've got connectivity. On, on the left we've got stability and on the right we've got agility. And what Trevor is putting out here is that you can't do all of them. You have to focus, it's a trade-off. So particularly, I want to draw your attention to the bottom left and the bottom right. Efficiency is more about regularity, routine, technology, while on the right we have more experiment, experimentation and empowerment. And the thinking here is that you can't be agile and efficient ultimately. Now there are, it's very simplistic. You can obviously have bits of organizations that are taking different approaches based on their own different situations, which is why it gets so complicated, of course. Um, but fundamentally and strategically, the thinking here is that you really do need to make a choice as to what is the overall focus of the organization that people will get to um, so that you can guide people around what they need to align to. Now, I find this fascinating. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Um, so the thinking is you need to match the leadership style and that enterprise level one I was talking about um, with the situation like this. So the standardized production and delivery bottom left might look like McDonald's. Capturing value of synergies might look like Uber. Whether or not it does that to a great extent for the value of society is a different conversation, of course. Um, exploiting um, economies of association could be like Rolls-Royce. And personalized services bottom left could be like tailored financial services where they need to make constant adjustments to the customer. So when we're thinking about agility, I mean, I always was thinking that agility is something we would all aspire to. But it depends, of course, and that's the requisite agility piece that's quite relevant to this entire discussion. But now look, you know, at, at this piece where we're talking about what's at the core, what needs to be distinctive about the organization. It's not always about agility and it's not always about one thing. So it's models of interaction. Now, what's the problem here? 
Well, the problem with alignment is that, you know, a lot of people are unaware of the risks of misalignment. So misalignment, as I put in my last session, is all about cost and waste and frustration and redoing work and people not cooperating and business results not happening as much as they'd like to, even failure. So the risks of misalignment are very present indeed, but many enterprise leaders are unaware of these risks. Nobody owns enterprise alignment. I would doubt, I, I would debate whether or not there should be people owning it as opposed to owning the process, but that's a matter of kind of debate as to the terminology we're using there or the definitions of what owning is. The more complex it gets, the more need there is to align, but the more difficult it becomes because it's more complex. So that's the third part. Sometimes activity is just mistaken for progress and people feel aligned when actually there's, that doesn't make any difference. And there's a fifth one I'd add here to um, Jonathan Trevor's list, which is that the enterprise strategy is not understood and it's not supported. And that comes back to the definition of alignment then. So let's have a look at that. Alignment level one, let's say that's alignment of the enterprise to the strategic intent, that's those five boxes. Strategy, purpose, systems, capability, architecture. The second level is about alignment of people to that. We cannot assume that people will just align to that without some kind of work. And so far, we know that um, corporate communications and the sort of PR based approach that came up in the 80s just isn't sufficient anymore. A, because people don't appreciate it, but B, it's just not relevant enough. I'll get onto that. But alignment of people to the enterprise is, is a level two. That's where, I'm, that's where I work. And alignment of people with each other to implement the strategy effectively, that's a kind of horizontal alignment, if you like, is that third piece. So I'm coming back to it again. I'm kind of repeating myself a bit in terms of what is alignment. But this, I think, is the challenge. And we've already looked at the problems. So the reason why the, it's so difficult to get people alignment to the strategy is because all of these message at the top about purpose, vision, mission, strategy, brand and values in the people side of a strategy and all of the systems piece, goals, targets, reporting lines, process and tools, there seems to be so much that the top level of the organization is trying to tell the people who are working in the organization underneath them if it's a hierarchical sort of strategy um, organizational um, setup. In the middle, these, this gray bit is these completely insufficient, in my view, conversations that are trying to make sense of everything. And the reason why they're so limited is because they're hampered by the social and political kind of dances that people have to make in organizations when they're reporting to, the, to an organization, when they feel that they have a certain role or it's not their place to some, say something or it's maybe not safe to say something. So conversation alone, I feel, does not bridge the gap between what teams are trying to understand in order to implement and what the organization is trying to get across to them. And line managers are placed in the middle to try and bridge that gap, but they've got their own sense to make of the world. And I, I'm, that, that's where sort of we, we had a discussion on this before. And there's a fundamental piece around this, which is that when these messages come down from the top, you're missing this dialogue and people can't make sense, people, people, sorry, make sense of the world in their own ways and you cannot tell people to align. So in terms of leadership, we've got this part one role of a leader, which is about framing up the situation. Let's tell people, let's spread these messages about what is the strategic frame, what's available to them and everything else. But then if we're asking them to go into the second part, which is having people aligned to that, you can't just switch to an implementation mode as a leader. You can't expect leaders to become all of a sudden objective and do that. Now, some leaders do. I'm not trying to simplify this too much. But when there's this role flip to an implementation piece, leadership has a hard time and we're missing the dialogue and we're missing the dialogue because it's seen as being too unwieldy to have people discuss all of this. There's too many people, many organizations are just too big. Even apparently the magic number is 17 people that you can mentally keep track of in order to be able to, to understand what how they're perceiving things and how you're perceiving things and come to some shared mental models. All right, so I'm coming close to this panel. 
Now, I haven't been able to see the chat, so I'm going to pause it at this um, piece to come on to a couple of questions, and I, I'll um, maybe put those into the chat. But the questions that I'd like to discuss today are, how does this relate to you and your sphere of influence? Because you're a leader and you are, everyone's part of an alignment process, multiple alignment processes. And how can we overcome the alignment problems to be more effective in addressing our bigger challenges? So I'm almost looking at everything that's been said so far in requisite agility. Everything that will be discussed next week when we come to summarize all of this in the bigger panel group sessions is stuff that we'll need to turn into effective action and alignment is needed for that. So I'm just gonna invite somebody to jump in I'm going to stop screen sharing so that I can actually read a bit of the chat here. So if anybody's been um, listening to this and writing in chat, I invite you to speak up and share your thoughts. Uh, I can start if you like. Um, I, can say, I, I really like what you were talking about. Your volume's a bit low. Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Uh, you're better now? A little uh, bit better. A little bit. I'm out in the archipelago, so maybe it's poor connection. Uh, but you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I like a lot what you are saying. Uh, what, what is especially interesting is that you are, are not going from the individual perspective uh, only. Uh, you are looking at the holistic perspective, and, and you, you're not saying that everyone can do whatever they want. You're saying that there are certain uh, intentions that, that uh, 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 should rule the organization to get the most out of it. But the problem is to get it across in a way that it's being uh, uh, adopted by, by uh, people on different levels in the organization. And, and you're also talking about work and you're talking about that intention uh, is basically the, the measure of uh, what needs to get done in an organization and the, the only thing I, I, I wasn't hearing uh, yet is that you can measure intention. And uh, intentional time is uh, what is really the, the key uh, for leaders to get across uh, to their management team and for the management team to get across to their direct reports. And, and if they are not clear with intentions I, and they haven't used time, they haven't used time span to measure the intention, then it becomes unspecific for everyone that needs to adjust and, and try to do their best in accomplishing what, what needs to get accomplished. So I think uh, alignment, the way you're talking about it, is exactly what is needed. But it's not only horizontal alignment that is needed, it's vertical alignment. And that's what you're talking about. So I liked a lot what you were saying. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. And I know that Sabina spoke yesterday about you know, your, the, the person, kind of alignment within yourself. And there's a lot to be said about connecting your personal purpose to the purpose of the, whatever efforts it is that you're participating in. Um, yeah. that, that's a kind of extra piece, but then to go, so I'm, I think the individual piece is relevant. It's just also not covered here so much that, um, and, and you know, you can, you can, but interesting to measure intention. Thank you for the comment. As a, uh, a core group, we sometimes talk about outside in and inside out alignment, uh, not, not just uh, back and forth and up and down. So uh, can you speak a little bit about outside in from organization to organization or organization to market and back? Not in a structured way, other than to say that, you know, dialogue is key. You can't just send messages and expect people to understand. So it would be the same principles. Um, I, I'm a big fan of structured dialogue and facilitated dialogue because it's, again, otherwise the dialogue just comes back to a conversation that's, I think, just doesn't get through what people need to cover, doesn't get to the right depth quick enough. People just don't have time for that. So um, I don't have much to offer there, but I'd be interested to hear if anybody knows of any structured resources um, or processes that do um, assist with outside in and inside out alignment.
Jan has got to have a view here. I, I would like to make a comment about alignment. Uh, what, what if what if you 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 must to align, but you don't agree with that? Yeah, that's a very good point. What my take on that is that alignment isn't agreement. That the process of alignment involves healthy challenge and putting things on the table and confrontation. But alignment is is compatibility because with compatibility you can involve diversity. And you can bring two different views together that are at least moving in the same direction. That's what we're looking for. Um, with, with compatibility, that doesn't mean that it has to be compatible all the time either. Um, I've been in conversation with Jan, who makes great points about the fact that things are constantly changing and you can never really stay aligned. And there's lots of dynamics to consider in alignment. Um, the, the dynamic to consider is that the creative tension involved in a constant alignment process would mean that um, sometimes people agree, sometimes people don't agree. But if it's the team goal first, if it's the shared goal first, then you're always moving towards, constantly towards um, a kind of shared mental models that will support you. If, if I may add something, my experience with alignment is that the categories used are very different on different levels in the organization. The model that you just projected, distinguishing between enterprise purpose, business strategy, organizational capability. I don't remember the, uh, the other two. Uh, these are typical categories used at higher levels in the organization. But if you look at, for example, middle management, uh, uh, the focus is much more on uh, cross and transfers or so collaboration within the organization. And the categories used are much different. Uh, if you then go to the people who are in close contact with clients, uh, what Jordi pointed at, uh, the internal outward, out, internal outward uh, perspective and vice versa, uh, that comes with again, different categories that are used at particular levels. And the question that I have is, well, uh, how does that work if you use the same categories at all levels in the organization? It seems very difficult for me to do that because the perspectives uh, uh, at different levels in the organization are so different. Uh, and even the idea about what needs to be aligned is so different at different levels. What's your experience with that? Well, I don't think that I, I, I'm not, I'm struggling to understand a bit because I don't think that the strategy and the purpose and the systems in an organization are anything other than at the strategic level and that it's how people understand how it relates to them that changes, but it's still the same theme. So I, could you give me an example that is different at the middle level that is not in another level? For, for example, at the middle level, uh, uh, often they, they often speak about customer journeys to, to follow Jordi's point. And in designing customer journeys, you have uh, a perspective of processes that need to be aligned, such as customer care with IT, with uh, order intake, invoicing, and so on. And the idea of the customer journey is to get the experience aligned outside from the client with the organization. And within the organization, kind of uh, the purpose of alignment is a fluent process. And strategy there, the word strategy is, uh, gets an interpretation as uh, enabling, let's say, fluency and avoid waste and rework and repetition and uh, let's say suboptimal client experiences. While at a higher level strategy, has a quite different connotation uh, and a quite different fulfillment. It's uh, related, for example, to business models uh, and business model choices uh, and ecosystemic uh, relationships uh, which need alignment. Uh, 
And this is quite different from the perspective in the middle of the organization. You see, the categories we use get a really different meaning in different dialogue spaces in the organization. I think we are in violent agreement, actually, because that's the relevance gap that I was talking about. I mean, okay. in order for people to align, they need to understand how is that sentiment, for example, the strategy, how is that relevant to their work? And that's so difficult to see sometimes. So th that's why a lot of corporate speak is just blah, 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 blah messages that so many people lose trust in leaders because they can't relate to them. And that is the alignment. So there's a lot of people in organizations who are scared to ask the question, but what's that got to do with us? Well, and Lynn's, and Lynn's, how does it relate? Yeah. Lynn's, 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 uh, uh, he, he is absolutely right. Uh, if you look at organizations that, that are uh, under heavy pressure when life is at stake, like the uh, police force or, or the military, but it's the same when it's crisis in organizations when you have a media uh, 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 attack or something like that. Uh, what, what happens is that, that you, what, what, you, what you look at leadership is uh, on the first level leadership. If you have operators in organizations, you don't have that in software development, but in, in most other areas, you do have that in McDonald's and, and uh, areas like that. Uh, uh, then you, you have direct leadership on the first level. And that leadership is very, very different from the next level, which is indirect leadership. This is the kind of training that they apply. And then on the next level, you have strategic leadership. And that's very, very different from indirect leadership. When we talk about middle management in Agile, uh, both the developers are in the middle management, but also the, the team leaders in, in the scrum teams or whatever you call them. And, and, and only their manager are on the strategic level. And, 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 and they work with very different things. And the time span in these different roles are totally different. And their tasks they are operating are also totally different and should be. And, and it's also motivating for people when they get tasks on the right level. Yeah, but what, what Lindsay points to, namely the necessity to uh, be able to relate to the larger picture, uh, relate what you do to the, to the whole, uh, is important. And I, I'm wondering, uh, both Ulf, uh, Ulf and uh, Lindsay, uh, what is it in the type of intervention that you do that uh, enhances uh, the creation of making that link to the, to the broader picture of the organization and understand, helping people to understand that how they, for example, think about strategy is not necessarily the same as how is thought about strategy at a, at a higher level. Uh, how do you do that? Well, we ask qualitative questions about at, at different levels. And we, we ask, what is the vision of the organization? We ask for a sentence there. We ask, what is the purpose of the team? And what are the goals of the team? Mm -hmm. And how aligned do you think the team is? That's a rating question to the vision of the organization. And when you take in different views from people on a qualitative open field text question basis, and then you codify them and what we mean by codification is you you organize the the words so that you don't change the meaning but you match the meanings where applicable so that you can you can see them in a graph you can see where um the alignment gaps are because it's amazing the number of times that we ask people the question for example what's the purpose of the team or what's the vision of the organization how people will say completely different things, but they didn't realize that because they don't stop to have a conversation like that on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Their understanding can just drift out over a period of months or weeks based on their biases. Mm -hmm. So yes, when, yeah. For this comment also, because uh, I used to ask people uh, when I work with them, what is the most important relationship in an organization? What is the most important relationship? It's between the manager and the direct report. Okay, can I just take you back though? Because they don't understand each other. If, if, if the, the manager don't give context uh, and describes his own task or her yeah. own task, and if 
so doesn't uh, describe the, the overall task, the one that you are describing on, on the top level. You are not giving the chance to the one that is the direct report to complete his or her task, because if, if, if something happens that is unex, un, in, unexpected, then you don't know what to do. But if you understand yeah. the task of your boss and the task, of, that is exactly what you're talking about, I think, when you talk about alignment. Now, I know Zach's got his hand up, but I just want to quickly say that the, because people to make, need to make things for themselves, sense of things for themselves, the alignment process is not a consulting role. It's a facilitation role where they are able then to ask questions that they need to ask in order to be able to make sense of things in their way. That's the entire point. So, so I mean, I, I think we're all in a, we're, we're basically in agreement, but the way that we take our data and the way that we show the gaps between people and then put it back to them and say, right, you're all saying these different things. Let's have a conversation about that. What do you need to change to be more effective? And it's purely about Can I? Yes, I'm not. Somebody's got some background noise on. Sounds like the call to prayer. There. <laughs> Sorry, can I just go back to Zach, who had his hand up there, um, and Kashmir did as well. Zach, do you have a point? You're on mute. Uh, can I have a so question? The, so okay. the point about... Uh, sorry about that. So the point about alignment is something that, in particular, has been really important I, to me. I've, I threw a link in about Elon Musk, but the, if you go there, you see that it talks about aligning vectors. And if you read it, you, you get a quote from Musk about the business becomes the sum total of the vectors. And essentially it's how do the vectors align? Uh, it turns out that the very first thing that when the University of Texas football team went after basically coming out of a deep hole where they were very unsuccessful for a decade, and brought in a coach and the very first thing he told his coaches, his team, all of the spectators was we need to get alignment. And then he went through what they do. I grew up following the Boston Red Sox as a baseball team. And the joke used to be that you after a game, they were 25 people who went in 25 cabs they went in all different directions. And it was only once they got a question of alignment that they were able to even think about being successful. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing that this is only really becoming more of a common topic these days. Kashmir, did you have a point? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to your question earlier about inside out and outside in, because I think it's a really important question. And it kind of actually touches on what Ulf just said about relationships. I, mean, I, I would never ask the question, what's the most important relationship in this business? Because the answer is obvious. The most important relationship is the one that people have with themselves. And I think what, what you do with Mirror Mirror is, is really good because it forces people to have those conversations that they wouldn't even dream of having and pay attention to the unconscious biases and blind spots that they treat uh, people treat as well, they don't even treat, they don't even know they're there. That's why they're blind spots, right? So the fact that you raise these questions and facilitate these conversations, I don't know of a single leader of any company I've been to um, where I've asked, okay, what is the purpose of this team? And I've even asked them, you know, to blindfold everybody right down at any level. And I echo what you said earlier, uh, Lindsay, in terms of, you know, people are shocked even within their own team that they don't have alignment even amongst themselves. And so then you ask the question, okay, so you're the top team. Now, when you walk out of this room, what happens with this misalignment we've just found in this room? What happens when it goes two and three and four levels out? You end up with a cavern, you end up with a, you know, a big vacuum where people can't operate. And so, um, so I think the questions you're raising, um, the conversations that you're facilitating and servicing are crucial. Uh, to the health and well-being of an organization. And I think part of it goes back to back to the inside out 
you asked about was that goes back to this is a moment when I'm working with a leader when I know they start reflecting to them to the relationship to themselves to their own unconscious biases to their own prejudices uh, to their own blind spots and when you've reached that point that's where the real value gets created that's when you start to open up true alignment so no, I think the questions you're asking are crucial and I mean, you're saying today, I think in the last 20, 30 years, I think this has been an issue, but now has become even more critical given the iterations and speed of change where people, we really need to slow down um, and pay attention to the questions you're raising. Right, great. Thanks, Kashmir. And um, I think the question about what can we do in our sphere of influence, even if we had a very small sphere of influence, what we can always do is encourage and practice effective dialogue. Mm -hmm. And then a fantastic book called The Art of Dialogue, which is about 20 years old by, um, got it over here, William Isaacs. Um, and mm -hmm. it all starts there really, doesn't it? Because it's about people Absolutely. opening Absolutely. up to share mental models. Um, Ilya, um, did you have a point you wanted to make with your hand up there? You're on mute. Always happens, doesn't it? Uh, Bingo. Uh, uh, yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want just to have some comments and maybe questions on your description of a gap. Uh, the strategy is um, on a very high level. We can say that it's a policy level, and then you have operation down uh, level, and operation cannot uh, uh, be regulated just on a policy. So uh, there are process description, manuals, uh, in written, uh, in graphic, on, on, on tacit level, and they need to implement policy. So if you want to see whether the alignment exists or not, you need to see whether this operational level um, executive documents are aligned. Uh, if they exist, if they don't exist, uh, everything on the tacit level and uh, it, it's more difficult because uh, uh, a policy via customer centered uh, organization doesn't mean anything unless uh, on the low level uh, there are uh, instructions how you meet the customer. So then just for policy that doesn't make uh, uh, any change unless it is converted maybe through several level of uh, layers uh, into operational uh, documents that are implemented in, in, in practice. Well, my reaction to that would be that I think documentation is, is you know, crucial and very important, but fundamentally alignment comes down to how people perceive things because perception is reality and things keep changing. And it's yeah, but, yeah, I understand that, but uh, your investigation, how they perceived, uh, what? Uh, perceived upper level policy, but- I'm uh, on my meeting, Ronnie. I'll maybe, send it. Okay, maybe it's also interesting- I'm, I'm really pissed how, at him because I-, I Okay. Thought we can- uh, I, <laughs> Is it my, my turn or not? Uh, may, maybe it's interesting to know how they, received uh, operational uh, level documents and whether they follow or not follow whether they, they understand that and then make a connection to a policy level document. Anybody got a follow on from that? Zach, you got your hand up? Okay. I mean, the other thing is that we're talking about, because we're talking about diversity, we're talking about different kinds of people. I mean, some people find it very difficult to absorb information from written documents. So they kind of, some people learn, you know, there's all these different learning styles out there. You know, we, that's where it comes down to, you know, there's documents, there's dialogue, there's anything else, but whatever, whatever helps, I think is just worth it. Whatever helps in an effective way is um, fundamental. Lindsay, I was uh, <clears throat> going to make a comment about the younger generation. Uh, communication is critical to alignment, but they have not learned how to communicate. They communicate by text. They don't understand nonverbal. They don't get nonverbal cues. They don't see it. 
So they don't know whether or not people are aligned or even accepting the, the listening to the message because they just do a text. Watch them at the dinner table. They don't even talk across the table. They text across the table. So it's an interesting uh, challenge with the younger generation from a yeah. communication point of view. Yeah, it can be very transactional and it's almost like another whole culture. I mean, we're, we're struggling with international cultures and cross-cultural communication to start with. Um, and then we've got the generational differences. Stephen? I, I, like, I like to support Steve, you. Stephen, I, I want to make sure that I get back to you on that. Uh, if you think about what the current younger generation is supposed to be, it's that they are supposed to be media savvy, that they are comfortable using different modes of communication. Possibly the reason that they text, this is a question, is that saying what they are seeing is something that would be pushed away, that would be uh, disparaged because the people who are sitting there have a very different view of the world. That's a question. Uh, I think Aiden has a sense that maybe there's something there. Can I, do you want to come back to that anybody or can I just address something from Ulysses in the chat? I make a comment on Ilya, just shortly. He, he uh, I, I fully support what he's saying. I also understand what you're saying, Lindsay, that people perceive things differently. And also what Stephen is saying, that it might may be that, that, that younger people uh, uh, needs a different kind of uh, communication. But still, it remains the reason why I'm pushing the relationship between uh, the, 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 the manager and the direct report. It's not that I don't think it's important for the individual to find out his or her own uh, drive and also, of course, understanding the customer or the user. But, but it is, if, if you are to get alignment, it's not enough to have alignment horizontally. You need to get uh, alignment vertically. And, and even if people want to text only, <laughs> the young ones, uh, uh, I still think that the dialogue and, and the understanding and the commitment and the alignment between the, the manager and the direct report is the most important relationship within the organization. Yeah, and I think the kind of alignment that we were talking about, the strategic alignment, alignment of people to the strategy includes the interpersonal and the topic related alignment uh, vertically. So I, I, I absolutely agree that you know, purely because of what Jan was saying in the sense that people perceive different constructs in such different ways, some categories don't even seem to relate to others. If they don't relate to others, where are we then? So we have to be able to get a, 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 a line of sight vertically as well as horizontally in terms of the intent and the implementation. Ulysses, let's come back to your comment. Nice meaty one there. Alignment is... Uh, yeah, I what are you saying? I, yeah, I, I just want to say that in organization, there are like two big parts. The one, one of the part is responsibility. What, what, what company, what are, what we value? What, what are the, what are the things that we need to understand as a, as a, as an, a kind of obligation for us? And then there's another part of freedom. What, what, what are, what are, what is our autonomy to, 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 to respond uh, in, 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 in different situations. So, so for, for, for that, it's, it's necessary some social framework where people can interact and not just uh, the top pushing, communicating and saying, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to believe, but, but, but a framework of social frameworks so, so people can talk and can discuss and, and can understand the beliefs of other people, not, not because, because the, the only way of, of doing things is, is when you believe in that. So. So uh, you, you just you just need to, to have this structure, this framework, this this thing that that companies what, what companies value. So companies value this this strategy, these values, uh, this kind of segment, uh, customer segment, blah 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 blah. So then you execute it by yourself and talk and and give them 
uh, uh, like structure to talk and to discuss and to and to find and understand the the, the problem deeper so they can find solution by themselves but alignment is just a shared understanding so if people are aligned on the fact that the role of a certain body needs to be autonomous that's alignment and end of end of detailed discussions so i mean alignment isn't always having people be told what to do at all that's not um the point here um alignment is about aligning on roles so or or anything that's fit for purpose it doesn't mean telling people what to do so maybe that was the misunderstanding there i mean you can be a we can be aligned here that we are all in a voluntary place that anyone can leave when they want anybody can put their hand up and and or put something in the chat we're aligned on that protocol for this event you know somebody might not be aligned if they said well you know can i can i say am i allowed to say something uh, uh, just uh, if i uh, can uh, uh, give an example uh, about the football team so if we take the the football team preparing uh, to walk onto the field so if uh, no one on the team knew the rules of the games and uh, nobody understand how to play the position and the field uh, for instance was unmarked uh, so they do not know how to make progress toward the goal line uh, this would be not a uh, very effective team uh, and the organization uh, or business organization uh, is not different uh, about this team so every member of the team uh, must understand the rules and know the goals and uh, know how to play their position. And uh, if they do, like a member of a football team, the employees of uh, this company or can use their unique skills, knowledge, and creativity to help achieve this vision of the organization. Uh, there is a book called uh, Good to Great by uh, Jim Collins that explains the best result that come uh, when leaders give employees the freedom to act within the framework of well design system. And uh, by establishing uh, the shared folder and the clear goals and understand the metrics leaders uh, uh, enable these employees to use their skills and knowledge to innovate and take cal cal calculated skills. Uh, this is just an example. I uh, think that football like Real Madrid or Zinedine Zidane is a facilitator and a coach and uh, everyone on the team can do the best and his skills to make the goal. I have a comment to that. Uh, if you look at Collins and uh, Go to Great, uh, I find it very interesting book also, uh, as uh, very many people in the world did read this book. But uh, you also know that 11, of the 11 companies that were great, uh, today is only one that still is great. And that was a retrospective anal analysis that, that uh, as, as those of you that know natural sciences, would never uh, approve, for example, to register a pharmaceutical based on retrospective analysis. You need to run prospective studies where you have a hypothesis. And also the, the former competitors, he, they had 35 companies that were to be successful that they had rated uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, in the 80s. And uh, it, it was the number one bestseller in management literature. But out of them, uh, very few then continuously or sustainably were successful. And he's the one that put shared values on top of the list of how you make uh, successful companies. And, and when he wrote the book 20 years later, he wrote, there are no successful companies. But what we're trying here to explain is how do you become successful in, in leading organizations? And, 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 and those concepts like uh, management by values or management by objectives and so on, that are isolated concepts, they don't work they work over time and are not proven scientifically at all what you need are holistic concepts that address also the other parameters that are important for example knowing where to go the strategic one that you mentioned also Lindsay, and and also knowing how to structure the organization but the most important thing it turns out 
it seems like, at least according to us, that has been using a science for 20 years, measuring levels of managers and levels of, of, of roles based on time and intentional time. Uh, it turns, it seems to us that choosing the right leaders is the number one parameter because the external world may be a, a good or bad. But if you have the wrong leaders, you, you mess it up, whatever it is. Uh, but how can you choose the right leaders? Pardon? Choose the right leaders. And yeah. choose the right leaders. Yeah. I agree with that. And, and we haven't... Sorry, Wolf, the question is how? How do you choose? How do you choose the right leader? Yes. The level of capability needed. And, and if, if, they, if they are, if you look at, at the, uh, uh, um, the, the development of kids, uh, you, you know that they develop in four stages. But Elliot Jacks were showing already in the 50s uh, uh, and, and definitely uh, confirmed by, uh, in the US Army Research Institute uh, in, in, in the 80s and 90s that there are also levels of, of, of adults. That, that are also uh, uh, possible to measure. And if you choose someone on the wrong level and put that person in, it doesn't matter if they are competent, it doesn't matter if they're motivated, it doesn't matter what, 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 what they can do. If, if they are not on the right level, they, they cannot handle the, the complexity. And, and, and it's not only complexity, it's uncertainty we're talking about. The uncertainty is as important a word as complexity. And if, if, you, if, you, if you don't have managers on the right level and, and have the ability to be foresighted and see where to go on the top level and, and are able to break that down to each level, if, they, if you don't have that, then you, don't, you cannot develop a, a management system that works. And it's the same with Agile. It's, it's the same with alignment in, 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 in lean, horizontally. But, but you also need to consider the vertical axis. And that's what we we're talking about. And that's why I like so much what you were saying, Lisa. Thank you. I mean, I think, you know, when we're talking about alignment, the, the, the success factors for alignment um, certainly start with you know, leaders and, and the people who are participating in behaviors. Um, it, it's, it's key. But maybe I could bring this question back to where we are now. Um, you know, we've talked about alignment. We've looked at where we are. We are contemplating um, the future. We've had a lot of discussions. Um, what would you like to see come out of requisite agility in these sessions that will tangibly make a difference, that can implement some of this intent? Um, how can you see that we're going to move forward on this and, and, and align as a group of remote participants in an exercise here. Jordi, do you want to make a comment on that at all? <laughs> uh, um, during, uh, during Benjamin's um, uh, session the other day, we were asked to uh, uh, acknowledge one another's gifts and uh, a gift that was acknowledged about me was uh, willingness to go first <laughs> so um looks like uh looks like uh, i have something to live up to um so yeah i and not to be self-serving um but uh so much of this uh discussion reminds me of the content that i presented isn't that interesting <laughs> that the things that my mind is full of uh happen to be resonating with the things that other people are talking about um uh, so what I would be interested in is uh, a discussion of the difference between um, using uh, a, a verbal in-person uh, or even a verbal via uh, remote Skype type connection like, uh, like we're having now <coughs> uh, uh, alignment session, you know, a co-discovery, co-facilitated uh, 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 where are we, where are we going kind of session versus a um, full on uh, uh, text based asynchronous um, 
uh, 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 session. That, and in my mind, I'm even I'm even considering uh, not even using texts that have been directed to people in terms of questions to answer, but found texts like email threads uh, or confluence pages or Jira items um, as a way to uh, uh, get at that sense of what are people's priorities, uh, what are the structures within which they're working and how do they uh, uh, you know, reinforce or interfere with one another. Um, I'm interested in that dialogue uh, because it, for myself, I, I think that there's benefits to going any which way. Uh, it would just be interesting to know what those trade-offs are in people's minds. Did that make any sense to anyone? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. I mean, I, I don't want to keep coming in with a comment because I think my my perspective here, I, I've shared my perspective on 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 in a in a process level on how I think that we can interact to actualize some of the intent that you've just talked about and some of the intent coming up the rest of it. Um, I will gladly take last comments from people because we're kind of at, coming up to the end of the session here. Is there anybody that wants to raise a point that's come out of this or one of the other requisite agility sessions that you feel really ought to be um, included in as a point in the panel discussions for next week and that needs to be actualized? I would love to see you lead us through a mirror mirror session well i would like to offer a mirror mirror session to any team because we have to have a tangible shared goal and we have to be a team between five and 20 people i would like to offer a mirror mirror session to a team on a virtual basis uh, if you've got a real business and a real team or a real organization that is who you feel could do with some alignment support it's not a criticism of how you are. It's more of a, uh, you know, being misaligned is often just being in a difficult, complex situation. So it's not a criticism. I think a lot of people take the need for alignment as a personal criticism. It's not. If anybody's interested, please get in touch with me. And um, I'd love to show you how this would work and get a case study to share with everybody else. And if you want, you can use that platform. I agree with Zach that uh, uh, if you have a method to, 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 to really uh, get this group together uh, uh, based on all the input that we've had from each other, I, I think this group uh, knows the answer, how to create alignment and how to, to make requisite agile. I, I think the answer is in the mind of people here. And uh, I don't know your method. But uh, uh, what I used to call it when I run my method, uh, um, and I'm sure yours is as good as mine or better, but uh, then I call it pull the brains of those that have, have most to contribute. So that's, that's uh, uh, what I hope you are doing <laughs> with your method, because if you're applying that to this team, then I think the, the, the result will be very, very, very good. Uh, I'm just putting this on the screen so that you can have a look at the method um if you know to get practical about it you can't just pick a group of you know multiple multiple people and, and and bring them all together they have to have a shared goal a true shared goal and they have to be able to um i'll take this off the screen so i don't want to be advertising but that's that's where to find out about more about it you are allowed oh am i okay i'll keep it up uh, there because, because, so, uh, because i'm also part of mirror mirror yeah, Pierre is a trained mirror mirror practitioner, actually. Um, and we do train practitioners to deliver it in their own areas. We don't, we, we are merely trainers and suppliers of a tool that people can use. But the team has to be, this is quite a good challenge, actually. The team really shouldn't be bigger than 20 people. And the team should really be um, having a shared goal that is, is something that's primary for them. Um, so they're closely affiliated to, not just something that's just sort of that's competing with their other priorities. So if anybody wants to give me, uh, give some thought to how this group could form a team of less than 20 people um, and how it could have an objective that we could align around, then um, let's do it.
Good. And, and another way around is we here in this group, we always we demonstrated that we are aligned, we're keeping all individual votes, uh, and we don't need a leader. Hey. Uh, well, I'm going to take but, exception. But what, what, <laughs> what would be a common goal here for the entire group? Good question. I think we should discuss this in the panel next week, Geordie. Do you? <laughs> uh, I, I want, want to be quite honest. Uh, why why I, I got the invitation to get Lindsay here, not only because I like Lindsay, because I really believe we are looking for simple tools for us to start working with the team. And I guess alignment is one of the key of the entry key to start working on not only agile, but anything actually is. And these are very cool tools and in a coaching way, which is more, let's say, a soft, not hardly intrusive, is more soft and you start to listen to the system, how people are organized, and then you can come back again and again to improve it. Because uh, we are, or we can call it a living organism, if I don't, I'm not that metaphorical here, but an uh, organization are nev never stable. We are still moving, mm -hmm. right? In motion, so we have to keep mentioned aligned. So I, I mentioned here uh, from the agile practitioner or the Scrum practitioners here. Uh, if you take the Scrum ceremonies, like the daily standup or whatever, what we call the inspect and adapt session, is this is everything only about alignment? Yep. We align with the team level, then we align with the stakeholders, then we come back and align with the teams. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I I have an input for you. Sometimes these ceremonies become an overhead. They're not needed. If there's natural alignment, you do not need ceremonies all the time, right? Yeah, to be honest, disagree. Uh, means real agile practitioner uh, able to use Scrum in an agile way know what to do. Uh, the problem is uh, most of the agile techniques are not delivered in an agile way, more like a process. And I really understand my customer faith. This is boring like hell, and that's they are right because you can't see the value. Uh, no, I have to uh, zip. Since you you have been uh, you were asking the question about the goal, but but you have been uh, uh, taking the initiative uh, together with uh, some people. Uh, Steve, I think, has been involved in so on. Uh, uh, I I would love to hear what what you your anticipation or your intention uh, with. Uh, uh, this whole uh, process, uh, what you will end up with, what you think, because uh, you have probably spent the most time thinking about it and, and, and trying to, to conceptualize what this could lead to. So I, I would love to hear, as, as a teaser in, <laughs> for next week, I would love to hear you and Steve uh, uh, comment about that, the goal. Do you, do, do you want to hear it now or do you want to hear it next week? Yeah, as a teaser. Huh? As a drink. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the purpose of this particular maybe, all maybe, entire effort. Eh, who, who wanted to maybe speak? we could have a choice. Maybe not everybody wants to hear it today. All right. Oh. Uh, just a thought. Is anybody well, who doesn't I, want I, to hear it today? Let's. Can I? Can I make an observation? I think that whatever, uh, whatever actually gets said today. There's, there's absolutely no guarantee that it's going to remain, uh, you know, wanting to be said next week. So I think we're on safe ground <laughs> to say whatever we want, and then next week will take care of itself. That's, uh, that's my experience. I would respectfully disagree with that because it's going, it's going to anchor things right now, and there are too many anchors for us to worry about without, it, without, without adding another one. Fair enough, Stephen. Cool. We need, um, we need reflection on all the things that we've heard, deep personal reflection. I've learned a terrific amount from the sessions that I've had. And I would like to go up into this, the final sessions with an open mind about anything is possible. Okay. And, and let's not determine the outcome until we've gone through that process. And, and don't... We, 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 guys are in the, we guys are in the unknown, right? And until you really see what is happening and what works for you, you cannot re re define the unknown. Is that what you wanted to say, Stephen? 
Yes, I, I don't believe in a, a teaser. We know whatever comes out is going to be good. What it looks like is not one opinion, is what I'm saying. Oh, all right, so, you but I'll still... You can't uh, clear the pitch at this point in time, because I think you'll destroy the ethos of what you've built up over this period. If you're anxious, then fine, go and watch a film. <laughs> <laughs> now, may I make a comment? Sure. Um, I want to come back to something Lindsay said about, um, you know, we're, we're looking, we're, we are all here because requisite agility resonates conceptually with us for some reason within the context in which we're working. And I, I think it's really important to recognize that we have, a, we have a huge gift of understanding from this session about the importance of alignment and how we can serve as a, an attractor for alignment within our organization, within the space in which we operate and the sphere of influence that we have. And I would just call this out from the standpoint, there's a great book um, called Organization, Positive Organizational Scholarship. And one of the things that, one of the things that the, was pulled out is that just like Martin Seligman with positive psychology recognized that so much of the field of psychology was focused on pathology. What really works in human systems? What really works in human psychology? What are, you know, what are the, you know, the, 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 the positive aspects about human experience that we need to talk, tackle? And so the same concept was applied to organizational scholarship and saying, what do people do well in organizations? It's not just about what doesn't work what works well and how can we maximize that? And I would call it out that a, a, core, a core precept of what we're trying to accomplish with requisite agility is recognizing that as humans operating within a system, whatever that system may be, we have choices, we have, we have options. And if we're, as long as we're being conscious about them. The you know, biggest challenge I think in a lot of situations is that we have so internalized the belief systems, the values, the that we're no longer being reflective, as Jan would say. We're not taking reflective thought about what's going on in our situation, but now we have some choices. How can we become attractors in a complexity sense, how an attractor to draw alignment towards outcomes that are relevant to the organization and the needs of the business? And this applies to any situation. It could apply as much to the home or community or doing COVID and social distancing or better directing ourselves towards the needs of our, of our business and, and clients and whatnot. And um, I, I think it always becomes back to an issue of translation. The, the point that Ulf was making um, about the, the layers is recognizing that even Jack's talked about leadership as a practice, a practice that involves understanding intention at the higher level and then being able to translate that down. The role of the manager very much is a communication flow process of translating that message down. But it, from the standpoint of alignment, it's recognizing that it is a loop, that alignment as much is translating a message to the level of the capability, the level of, of action, if you will. But it also requires the feedback of understanding that that message has actually been received and you see that you can see that in behavior you can see that in a lot of things but I, I i guess it's a it's a point of recognizing that we all serve as having a role in this process of alignment and how can we become better at it that, well said i'm so annoyed that this stopped recording part way through that because that entire thing was just a really really nice summary and and i'd, I'd extend that to say that that feedback loop is Alignment is also allowing people to express feedback outside of their sphere of influence as input to tomorrow's strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's also the process of alignment. So it's incredibly um, rich stuff. Um, I think that's, that's a very really nice sum up. I'd love to take forward the, um, the sentiment from this call into next week's sessions, particularly on teams, around what's the purpose and the goal of requ requisite agility in this context. So. For me, this is a, a really nice wrap up. Jordi, how are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Yay. Thanks.
Yeah, I, I, it's really sweet of you to keep asking me how I'm doing. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting, well, and Scott, I mean, you know, the both of you have been on these sessions and seeing it all through and you're going to be on the panels, I guess. So I, I'd like to draw this session to a close. And, you know, I think the chat's been perfect. I think the, the conversation has been um, great because there's always a danger that nobody says anything, um, but we haven't had that. Uh, so, so I just want to thank everybody for um, the opportunity to, to present today and look forward to seeing you next week. And wishing you all a lovely weekend. Great. Thank you, Lance. Well done. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Bye. Thanks. Thanks Pierre. Thanks, Have a great one.